This is the OTP presented by Farm Bureau Health Plans. Plan on paying less for the coverage you need with Farm Bureau Health Plans. Get a quote today at FBHP.com. With Rhett Bryant, Coach Dave McGinnis, Amy Wells, Ramon Foster, and Brent Hubbs from VolQuest.com, I'm Mike Keith. Titans busy but not busy on night two of the NFL draft. They only had one pick, but it gave them a lot to talk about because the guy they picked is a lot. <laughs> Tavondre Sweat, defensive lineman, 6'4 and a half, 366 pounds out of Texas. Coach Dave McGinnis, overall, this is a guy that Jim Nagy, the executive director of the Reese's Senior Bowl, called the most unique player in the NFL draft. Why does he think that, and why do you like this player? When you st when you study this player, the first thing you get, if, if you just hear the dimensions, you say, well, this is just a big guy that just sits down in the middle of the line of scrimmage, doesn't move, and then makes it impossible for people to move him. That's not the truth. This guy can, can crush the center guard triangle. He's got long arms. He's got the ability to move. He's got really, really good athletic lower body ability for a man this big. And the other thing about him is – the better condition he gets in, uh, he's 366 pounds right now. He gets down to a, to a National Football League body of 350 pounds. This is a guy that you pair him with somebody else. He's going to play a shade technique. You pair him with a, with a dominant three technique, which Jeffrey Simmons is. These are two people that two men can wreck that center guard triangle. Uh, he can affect passes. He's got long arms. He knows how to match hands. Uh, this, I love, I really like this pick for a lot of football reasons Devondre sweat is we, we talked to brian callahan uh about this and you mentioned that you know we talked about a comp player of vince wilfork he said yeah but he's he's bigger than that uh just a massive human being we talked about you know what we saw at the senior bowl and how a magnetic personality that he was he owned that ballroom on the media day that wednesday of that week and uh was very honest, according to Rand Carthon and and Brian Callahan, about what had happened to him and his brush with the law. It was a wake-up call for him. Seems very happy to be a Tennessee Titan. For the OT people who don't know, he got a DWI on April the 7th at 4 a.m. after being struck in his car from behind at a car traveling a high rate of speed Uh he ended up doing the breathalyzer test, barely over the legal limit, which is why it's a DWI and not a DUI. But Ramon Foster, it's something that happens that gives you pause about a guy that people were worried about how serious he was about everything. It happens only 19 days before he's drafted. The Titans certainly took it seriously. And you've had interaction with this player. You feel like he's worth the risk not just as a player but as a person from what it was like for you i do um and just hearing this press conference man you get genuine out of him you get a guy that understands look i'm here for a reason i'm gonna make sure i maximize his reason as much as i possibly can and that's what i liked about him too he doesn't shy away from his size he doesn't shy away from his style of play he doesn't shy away where he's from and he knows how to play the game too he's a super unique guy to me too because here's the thing to the same point of um, him having a DWI. Everybody needs an aha moment. I'm sure all of us in this room have had, all right, it's time to get it together. He had it, of course, in the pre-draft. And I'll say this also. You look at his pathway through Texas. He went from a guy that was rotational, finding his way through until his last year right now, Outland Trophy winner, Big 12 player, defensive player of the year, and made himself into a second-round pick. It doesn't get any better into what he can possibly be, one, as a player, but also as a human being, too. And the other thing is this, to me. Y'all know how it is if you have kids or raise kids or been around them and your nephews, whatever the case may be. Whenever they do something, they show you, oh, you got to continue to show me you're going to do that thing. The demand for him to be good and be consistent and be great has to be a baseline from here on out for his professional career. Well, the good thing about that is he is going to be surrounded by people who are going to hold him to that standard beyond just the head coach and the general manager, the people who vetted him and made the decision to bring him in to be a Tennessee Titan. He's going to be in a room with Tracy Rocker, his 
position coach who we know is going to hold him to a high standard. We know that he's going to be in a room with Jeffrey Simmons, who was so excited. He was putting all over social media that he's so excited to have another guy down in the trenches with him and a big man to be holding down the line. I mean, he put all kinds of stuff on Twitter and Instagram. And so Jeffrey Simmons is excited. He is not going to let this man let him down. He won't do it. And so he's going to be surrounded by people who are going to give him the support that he needs to continue to grow and learn how to be a professional. I mean, the guy's coming out of college. He's still relatively young. He's going to be maturing still. He still has a lot of room to grow, but he also has an incredible personality and he's such a likable guy. We just saw a press conference that was, what, 10 minutes maybe? And in that, there were so many funny things that he said. He had the media in the palm of his hand. He was just a really entertaining, fun, likable guy to talk to. So I think that if he can get here with the size, with the physicality, with all of the physical traits that he can put on the field, mix that with the maturity and learning how to be a professional and having an incredible personality, this is an incredible addition to the Tennessee Titans. He hasn't always been 366 pounds, Brent Hubbs. As a matter of fact, when he left high school... He was considerably less. Yeah, he played defensive end. And I think that's part of the uniqueness of this story is that he was a 6'3", 249, 250-pound guy coming out of high school, 74th-ranked player in the state of Texas. He was just kind of a oh, – he was a solid end, but just kind of an okay end. What is he going to turn into? Coach, he, he's 110 pounds heavier than he was four or five years ago He's still learning to play inside in tight space. He's still learning to play with that body, which is why I think this franchise is so excited because there's a lot of feeling that his best football is in front of him, but he brings some outside skill sets as a pass rusher to the inside. Yeah, and that's a great that's a great point because you can see that in his play. And as I said, he's not just a front end loader that just drops his blade and just sits there and, and lets you know tries to let people try to run through him. He can move. He can move. He gathers space, and that's a great point that you bring up. It, it's it's really good insight in, into that. And I think there's a lot to it. And plus, uh, we know that this group of coaches and front office people led by Rand Carthon and, and Ryan Callahan, they're going to deep vet these people. They're going to deep vet them, and they show that they were going to, you know, in, in a pretty special way. Yeah, they actually went to Texas to sit down with him last week because they did not feel like they got to know him well enough on his 30 visit to Nashville due to the fact that it was roughly 48 hours after he was charged with DWI. And Amy, his his whole thing and all of that was he spent his entire visit in Nashville sort of on the defensive. They didn't feel like they knew him. Right. He's trying to explain himself. I mean, he's still it's very fresh in his mind. It's very fresh in the minds of the, the people that he's visiting with. And I, I think it tainted the whole experience for both sides because he he wanted to make sure that everybody knew exactly what happened. He wanted to explain it. He wanted to just work through it. And, you know, when you've got something weighing on your mind, you can't really get past that. And I think that's where he was at. And for the Titans staff and people that were trying to get to know him as a person beyond that incident, they they felt like they couldn't get through it. There were other things that they wanted to address and talk about. And he he was very singular focused on that one thing. So taking the time, making the effort to go to Texas to meet him in his own space with his family, meet the people who are closest to him as well, gives them a better idea of him as a person, um, a little more holistic, well-rounded view of who this person is, what he's like when he's not tense and trying to explain something, but who is he just as a man, as a person? Well, I think it says a lot about the, just the focus of the franchise in terms of what they're looking for in their building and the culture. And Ramon, you talked about having an aha moment. I mean, is there a bigger aha moment than 48 hours after you have that incident? You're you're meeting with a potential employer. I mean, if, if nothing gets your attention more than this just happened to me when I had a trip scheduled to my future employer, I, I don't know. I don't know how much more aha you have to have at that point. 
and, and pretty much had to do the perp walk. I mean, he was he was on you know big networks, walking out of the police station and having to hold his head down. And you can hear it in his voice. You can hear the remorse. You can hear uh, a guy that's looking forward to a second chance. We've all been in teammates of people, been around folks that we know and love that have had second chances. And this is just one of his that you hope that he 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 really takes it full steam ahead and and become the consummate pro. Because again. His personality is so doggone attractive. I, I was walking by him and waiting on him to get the interview for us at the Senior Bowl because we needed to talk to this guy. We we needed to, and I felt this way, and I know you guys did too, sitting at the tables, just like, sit him down. And plus, he wanted to sit down with us too. It was just like, I got to it. They're pulling me here. And it was, it was super unique. But I'll say this too, in my coverage of this team since 2020, um, to have a group of young, youthful talent, can you imagine how him and Peter are going to battle? They won and pass. They got to go at it. Him and Kush have to go at it. He's got a teammate here in Coburn who who who, who will guide him, tell him how to Talking practice. about Keandre Coleman, Keandre, yes. a defensive lineman from Texas who he essentially considers his football big brother. Yeah. And and it's it's to me, I, I'm getting chills now talking about this because I, I see how teams are built. And it's usually Coach Mack inside out, and it's mm. iron shopping iron. And when it boils down to it, most football coaches and football people will tell you, if you can get your bigs to show the littles how to work, then everybody else got to follow in suit because who's going to fight them, number one, okay? And then you got the biggest numbers, you're the biggest bodies. It really takes an uptick to a different level when you have guys commit themselves. Well, let me just say this from a coaching perspective, having, you know, done it in this league with a, when your bigs are your leaders, then the other people gravitate to that. If your bigs are fractured and not right, then everybody else is fractured because it's just, it's a big man's game. But when you, when you're, and I'm talking the offensive and the defensive line, when that group is, 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 is seriously, they don't have to be loud, but if they are looked up to in a locker room because of the way they practice, the way they work together and the way they play, everybody else falls in line because it's just it's just human nature. It's just the way it is. And the great teams I've been with, the bigs were always in charge, whether they said it or not. Mike, let's go back to what you said a moment ago when he had the accident and the DWI. He was rear-ended at a high rate of speed. And from the accident report, his car rolled three times, and he got out of it. So here's the other part that you're thinking. All of us have been in car wrecks, some of them pretty serious, and it'll shake you up. So... Not only do you have the potential legal part of this two days after when you're going to visit, you're rattled. I don't care how big you are. This is a life thing that has happened. Someone has rear-ended you at a high rate of speed, and, you're, and maybe your life flashes for you before your eyes a little bit. So that's what I'm thinking as we're talking about this. We talked a lot about Tavondre Sweat on the broadcast for Titans Radio because he was the Titans' only selection on day two. In day one, of course, it was J.C. Latham, seventh overall pick, big offensive lineman from Alabama. We had a chance to visit with him, Amy Wells, and he is another big human. He he is the biggest human, Mike. He might be one of the biggest humans I've ever seen. He's got hands that are bigger than my head, I think. <laughs> I mean, he was just a giant person with a giant personality and was another guy that it was so great to have the opportunity to get to know him. He is so excited to be here. He is so excited to get to work. And I think that he is going to be a great addition to the Tennessee Titans. Here's a chance to hear the interview that Amy and I did with J.C. Latham earlier in the Bet MGM studios on the OTP. J.C., did you think the Titans were going to be the team that picked you? Yeah, um, me and my agents had high hopes. Uh, we were trying to do like a best case, worst case scenario type of thing. So, you know, best case, um, just from what team would pick me first. And, uh, you know, just there was speculation going around from Combine literally to um, two nights ago or even, even yesterday morning. They're like, yeah, people in the organization are saying this, you know, um, teams are saying you're going here. Other teams are saying you're going there. You know, so and then literally when they had to pick, like all the cameras came around me. So I was like, oh, shit. like, you know what I'm saying? I'll do it. I, was, I didn't mean to swear, but it's okay. I was just thinking, I was like, oh, like, is this going to happen? 
Um, and then we went to, you know, he felt like the best situation would be in Tennessee, uh, mainly because, you know, that's where we had the most um, energy and love and affection for as a team, um, both ways. So it was very, it was very nice there. Um, and then, yeah, he didn't see me getting past 10. So, but yeah, he said as far as teams that, you know, kind of communicated to me the most, um, Tennessee was there, you know, and he said um, every, literally, I think like, even during the draft, the um, Titans were talking about agent like, hey, like, is his phone ringing for the Chargers? Like, are the Chargers going to get him? You know, so he was like, yeah, I'm not going to lie. Like, if the Chargers don't get you now, Tennessee's more than likely going to get you. And it was funny because uh, he said that there was, like, a five-minute waiting period uh, that every team had to do. So, like, after the five-minute waiting period, I was thinking, I was like, well, they haven't called me yet, so I don't know if Tennessee's going to get me. And I looked to my left, and as soon as I looked to my left, my phone started ringing. So it was a, it was a blessed moment, a really, really big deal. And so You were here on April 8th for your 30 visit. Yes, sir. 18 days ago. Yeah. I bet it seems like five years ago now. Yeah. What do you remember from your first trip here to Ascension St. Thomas Sports Park? Yeah, I mean, you know, the first trip was really unique. It was a solar eclipse. So um, that was a really big day just in general. Um, and just talking to Coach Callahan, um, and we were going over technique. You know, we had it broken down. Every team um, has a schedule to follow. They want to get you out of by 2 o'clock. usually get up to the facility at like 8 in the morning. Uh, for breakfast and then nine o'clock is when you start. So um, nine o'clock is like 30 to 45 minutes uh, meeting each coach and by the time you're done, you leave. And I'm talking to um, Coach Callahan and you know we had a 30 minute window to talk and next thing you know, it's been two hours. So luckily our, our meeting was right before lunch. So um, yeah, they were like, yeah, you kind of got to skip lunch and head over here because you uh, you guys were talking all day. But we, yeah, you're we talking really, about Bill Callahan, yes, the, sir, offensive, the, the line um, coach. offensive line coach. Yes, sir. I really enjoyed it, man. I mean, just picking his brain over all the different type of techniques that we can do, um, how to handle certain moves, how to go over certain things. We watched film on, you know, he was with the Browns, so we watched film on that. We talked about potential lineups and where I would play and fit in. Um, and then we were just talking, just talking ball and just talking ball all day. So, you know, we really enjoyed that that process and really enjoyed just, just genuinely. I'm a student at the game, so I really enjoyed learning. Did you get to see the solar eclipse, though? Yeah. I want to talk a little bit about your history because it seems like throughout your career as a football player, you have always sought out a challenge. Mm -hmm. You go from your high school in yeah, Wisconsin, Wisconsin. Yeah, Wisconsin to IMG Academy. Then you're picking a school. You pick Alabama. You're always looking for the most competition. What is that? Is that just a part of your personality? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's always been something that I've been about. Um, just, you know, you don't really get a lot of credit or, you know, kids call it like cool points, you know, for beating up the guys you're supposed to beat up. But when you go against the top dogs and all that stuff, that's when you really earn your um, right and respect. So, um, you know, Saban had a quote. Um, that he said a lot, uh, when a student is ready to learn, the teacher will appear. And I, I've been um, unintentionally following that my whole life. You know, whenever I felt like I was ready for the next phase, you know, the next journey would begin, whether it was IMG, Alabama, all that. So, uh, yeah, I've always wanted to go against the best to be the best version of myself. Who were some of those teachers that you sought out or that appeared to you? It was really just the, the programs. I mean, uh, when I first went to Wisconsin, um, just a little background. Um, about it, third grade, my pops asked me if I wanted to play football, so I said, yeah. And I was on the defensive side of things, so I was playing DN, and um, I felt like I wanted to play nose because, like, I, I just I wanted to get to the quarterback as quick as possible looking right at the ball. And they, after two years, they banned me from playing nose. They were like, yeah, you can't, you can't play nose no more. It was already some rules about, because I was always taller, so they were like, yeah, you can't play any skill position because you're too tall and you're too big. So... <laughs> Um, yeah, that's why I played defense. And then we ended up going to a different league. I dominated that league, and I thought that's where I wanted to play high school at. And then as time went on, I figured I wanted to go to, you know, a, a school that was going to push me where Catholic Memorial came in at. And, um, you know, they did, they did great. And by my sophomore year, I was top 10 in the country, number three in my position as a defensive end. And um, IMG came along. So <laughs> next thing you know, uh, I met IMG and three guys get hurt, two uh, tear their ACL, one MCL. So they asked me to play O-line. I accepted the challenge. And uh, this was like two weeks right before the season. So um, yeah, I ended up going and um, playing O-line. And next thing you know, I'm number two player in the country, number one in my position going to uh, Alabama. So I've always wanted to, to seek out the, the best competition.
Is that why you have so much confidence right now? And not in a, like an over the top kind of braggy kind of way, but just a quiet confidence about you, yourself, and what you're able to do? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. But um, I'm not finna sit up here and say, you know, there won't be any adversity at all. That's what makes a player. But I know that I'm mature enough to understand that adversity will strike. It's guaranteed to strike. Um, and maturity is gonna show as far as how persistent are you and, and capable of handling it, you know? So. Um, I'm not going to say that, you know, my career is going to go smooth and I'm just going to do X, Y, and Z and, you know, seven Super Bowls off the bat, you know, but um, I know that I can't say that I'll give, you know, my maximum effort and seek out the best to be the best and um, handle adversity when it comes and be persistent. It would feel like the transition will be eased because you have Peter Skaronsky playing right next yeah. to you and he just went through that. Thoughts on kind of how that relationship will develop, you hope? Yeah, I mean, he sh uh, he shouted me out last night. He was talking to me with Will Levis. We were on the phone after the pick. Um, and I've been following him closely um, ever since he was at uh, Northwestern. Uh, when I first got my start at Alabama, you know, I mean, obviously we have social media. And nowadays you can get tagged with something. It'll pop up on your um, Explore page. So you really can't avoid it, you know. So um, just being tagged that, like, oh, Peter Squansky is here, but JC's kind of um, in the realm. He's getting better and better every week. So I always notice uh, his level of excellency that he plays at every single week and just always try to match that as a young guy um, my sophomore year when he was a uh, um, go ahead at uh, Northwestern. So You guys may build something special. Yeah, that's the plan. Yeah. <laughs> that's the plan. <laughs> yes, Speaking of something special, your head coach at Alabama, Nick Saban, said some really nice things about you, even more as a person than as a football player. Why were the two of you so close yeah. during your time at Alabama? I mean, um, I think what made it special was right when I got there, you know, I told him I wanted to be the best. And, um, you know, I told, I didn't tell him, I told all the coaches, like, hey, like, don't take it by no disrespect, but I, I just want to be completely transparent about what I am and what I'm not, you know? So I, I know I'm my versatility, I could do anything, but I want to be pushed to the limit every single day. And all of them were on the same page. So, you know, that built that relationship there. But, um, you know, words can only do so much. Trust is established when, the words meet the actions, you know, so, and he, he didn't like it, but, you know, just being in practice and um, I'm what you call it, I'm pancaking the D lineman and stuff, and he doesn't like guys going on the ground, but he's seeing the level of intensity that I'm playing to. And then off the field, you know, I'm, I'm bringing the guys together. You know, I was um, taking the guys on trips to Florida to make sure, you know, we were getting training uh, done together, but we also could enjoy a different city together, you know, uh, getting NIL deals for my group. So he saw that as well. And then he just asked the guys, he was like, hey, um, just ask every positional group, hey, what's the leader in your room? And everybody said me. So, you know, I think he just, that trust was really established over those three years from my freshman year being 17 when I met him, like, hey, this is what I want to be, to my junior year being 20, to I've uh, achieved essentially all of what I want. So, What was the most special part of being in Detroit for draft night? Oh, oh that's a great question. Probably, probably just being with my family and just soaking it all in. I mean... You know, I moved around a lot, moving from Mississippi to um, Wisconsin, then Florida, you know, to Alabama. And, um, you know, I, I just, I, I wasn't with everybody at the same time, you know, so I have a split family and a really big family. So, you know, we were with each other um, in two different, or in different times of my life. So just to really like uh, bring them all in together at once. I think that was the first time that everybody in my fa uh, family from both my mom and dad's side was together at a setting like that and my siblings as well as my best friend. It was just it was just so amazing to really just sit there and enjoy it all. So I really appreciated it. In essence, you have been on your own since you were 16. Yeah, 15, yeah. Move it, 15, moving yeah. to Florida to go to IMG and then going on to Alabama. How much do you feel like that has been a benefit to you in this process and will be a benefit to you as you become a pro now? Uh, I think that's extremely beneficial. I mean, any kid who gets a chance to uh, kind of leave his environment to grow and, and, and mature, I think, you know, unless they already have that stability at home, I think you should take it, you know, uh, because going to IMG, you know, you're, I'm 15 and I'm at uh, Florida, you know, coming from Wisconsin, I'm by myself. So it's like, you know, most kids are going to, hey, I don't really care about school, X, Y, and Z. And I, I fell victim to that for about a month or two. But then after a while, I realized, like, my parents aren't here. I have nobody here to hold me accountable and tell me, get this done. And, you know, this is what the real world is going to be like. You know, you don't have people who's going to walk your hand through things and make sure you get up for this or that or whatever the case may be. So if I want to succeed at the next level, I, I got to build the good habits now. So I was building the habits and discipline and everything I, I knew I had to do 
at 16 years old. So when I got to college, that's why I was able to have the conversation with the coaches on, you know, what to do. I just didn't know how to go about it at that level. But yeah, it was extremely beneficial. For someone who's as young as you are, you just turned 21, you're incredibly mature and incredibly self-aware. Have you always had that personality trait or is that something that you've had to grow and develop and learn how to do through those experiences? Yeah, the um, self-aware uh, part was something I definitely had to grow into. I was always transparent. Um, I grew up with my parents just, uh, just keeping it straight and keeping it 100. So they always tell me what, you know, what it is that you're doing good or you got to do better at or you're doing just completely bad, you know? So, um, and you know, some people say I'm, I'm too transparent, you know, I'm too, honest, you know, you got to learn how to be more compassionate, but I mean, that's not what I, the environment I grew up around, you know, if you're doing a great job at football, we're going to tell you you're doing a great job and it's just that simple, you know, and if you're doing bad, we're going to let you know, hey, you're doing bad. So you never have to feel the gray area of what I really mean to say, because I always speak from the heart. And that's always what my family uh, taught me and instilled into me. Tell me in a simple terms, just to describe to Titans fans, how do you play this game? What are sort of the action words? that describe J.C. Latham's play on the field? Intense, intense, physical, fast, and relentless. I mean, I'm all about being relentless and a relentless competitor, something that Alabama, I mean, I always was that, but they kind of brought it to light on what it is exactly. You know, a guy who's going the distance and then some to get the job done and never letting up despite the score. You know, one thing that they said that really st stood out to me is that you should be able to turn on the tape and take away the scoreboard and any game or any play of any game, you should be able to know you're playing the exact same. You know, we shouldn't look at a game where we're up by 21 and you're playing, you know, whatever, or we're down by 20 and you're playing. You should, it should be consistent all the way through. And that's a relentless competitor and that's who I am. All right, we're gonna finish with five questions. Okay. Which is something we like to do, kind of a lightning round, if you will. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I wanna do five questions. <laughs> Move. It's on. Let's go. Thanks, Mike. This is not normal. <laughs> <clears throat> Are you ready? Yeah. Five questions. Lightning All right. round. All right. It's good stuff. When the Titans play the Vikings, who is going to talk more trash, you or Dallas Turner? Ha, <laughs> ha, Oh, ha. Mm, pro I mean, probably me. Probably me. That's my guy. <laughs> so I'll, I'll let them know what it is. But I mean, whoever's winning, honestly, that's how it's going to go. So if, we, if they're winning, yeah, I'm going to know I'm going to hear Dallas talking all day. If we're winning, I'm going to talk all day. So, but yeah, no, nah, that's how it is. How did you get the idea to nickname yourself Trench King? Yeah, um, when I was playing offensive line, I, when I made that switch going into my junior year, my coach at the time, mentor um, to this day, George Hegeman, uh, best friends with um, Deion Sanders. And every time they call each other before a meeting, um, it's prime time. What's up, baby? So, you know, I wanted to hold myself to a standard to where I can not, I want to be prime time, but, you know, I'm not a DB and I'm not, you know, it's not, I can't take someone else's name. So, um, you know, every time you break it down, O-line, D-line, you got to say trenches. And I want to hold myself to the standard of being the trench king. So, That's a good answer. Which Titans player are you most excited to meet? Probably uh, DeAndre Hopkins or um, Calvin Ridley. DeAndre Hopkins is just an amazing backstory of, um, First off, you know, his mom was is blind and, you know, she never gets to see him play. So that's amazing. Love to talk to him about that. And then um, Calvin Ridley, um, he's just an amazing guy, you know, legend at Alabama. So just kind of go face to face with your legends and meet him. It'd be amazing. Speaking of Alabama, had you not picked Alabama, where would you have gone to school? Oh, shoot. I don't know, man. I, I really couldn't. It might have been. It would probably be LSU. Probably be LSU, yeah. They were close. They were real close. I was close with the coaching staff over there. Yeah, I like the I like the organization. But I mean, every time I tried visiting, uh, the first time I went, it was a tropical storm and it was really bad. The uh, airport had to get shut down, so I couldn't even go. And then the second time, literally like three days before COVID, and they canceled the whole visit. So I don't know. So those were your signs. Yeah. There you go. All right. Finally, do you know what number you are going to ask for? Fifty-five. I wanted 65, but it's a retired number. 55 is the number I started off with. All right. Hey, That's nice pretty job, good. Andy Will. Thank you. Better by you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate we it. We are so glad you are here, Trent. I'm glad King. to be here. Thank it's you so much. It's an exciting much. day for everybody who loves the Titans, and we hope you feel like you're part of the family already. Thank you. I definitely do. I love, I love it, man. I'm here already. SeatGeek is now the official ticketing partner of the Tennessee Titans. Whether you're buying or selling tickets to Titans games or any live event in Nashville, 
SeatGeek is the place to do it. SeatGeek, the new official ticketing partner of the Tennessee Titans. So, Titans fans can fan. All right. Day three upcoming. The Titans have five picks scheduled. 106. That's the sixth pick in the fourth round. 146, 182. And two late seventh round picks, 242 and 252. Rhett Bryan, what do they need to come away with on day three of the NFL draft? Uh, if we're to- looking at needs, another safety is somewhere you might want to start taking a look. Uh, an inside linebacker is another place you would want to take a look. And I wouldn't be surprised if they take another offensive lineman. How about tight ends? How about tight ends? I mean, you're looking at the tight ends that are, that are left on the board now. You know they're going to go to camp with more than three tight ends. They're going to do that. So that's where I would look. Running back, anyone? I've jumped in that world. I have said that. Uh, with Tony Pollard and also Tajay Spears, it, they're in a contact every play type of position. One of them might be out for Pinky. I always like to use that. Maybe out of a game for Pinky. Who's your third running back in situations like that? Uh, it'd be good to have a, a a draft pick be one of those guys. I know free agents come in and play those roles too. But if you can hand select one of your guys in this year's draft, I'd ride that, that running back wave. What about a wide receiver? In this great year of wideouts, they were fantastic at the top. There were a bunch of them on day two. There was thought that you could find quality depth on day three. You want to pick a wide out, Amy Wells? Uh, do I want the team to? Yes. Do I? Do you want me to pick one right now? Absolutely I wasn't not. Talking no. <laughs> yes, I do think that would be a great pick for the Tennessee Titans. Mac is. He's looking. He's looking at the, at the board. <laughs> Mac's trying to make me be the general manager here, and I'm not doing it. <laughs> We're going to wrap up this edition of the OTP. Thanks so much for being with us. Titans radio coverage at 4 o'clock on Saturday. That's 4 Central. You can hear it on Titans radio stations who are carrying us. You can also hear it on our flagship, 104.5 The Zone, and on the 104.5 The Zone app. For Rhett Bryan, Coach Dave McGinnis, Amy Wells, Ramon Foster, and Brent Hubs of AllQuest.com, Mike Keith thanks you for listening to the OTP.